Yali Mada, my name is Fahim Sachdina, and today I'm joined by Zabine Hirji, Future of Work Advisor to Deloitte and former Chief Human Resources Officer at RBC, Canada's largest bank. She's also a leader in civil society and a visiting professor at King's College London, as well as on the external advisory board for equity, diversity and inclusion for UK research and innovation. Zabine, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Fahim. I'm delighted to be with you. Fantastic. So in your role as an advisor to Deloitte on the future of work, we always continue to hear about the future of work and this concept. Can you explain what does this, what does this mean to you? And you know, why don't we start with the key trends driving the future of work? Sure. Yeah, that's a great place to start. And off now, when I've been talking about it over the last few months, I, there's a little bit of a pre-COVID and, and uh, during and post-COVID conversation that plays out. So three trends, really. First one, which I think everybody jumps to, is technology. Clearly, that is the biggest driver of what's changing the nature of work. And the way that I like to think about it, it's really about this fusion of technology and humans and how we can use technology to do what machines can do better and really um, use humans to do the, the, the kind of work uh, where we have the, the, those skills and capabilities are not replicable by machines. And so I don't see it as a human versus machines. Ultimately, um, the, the aspiration here is that it becomes that fusion and of course it's leaders who are making those decisions ultimately that, and the choices that are made that will determine that. Uh, but as I think about, so what does that mean for work? It doesn't matter what role you're in. Often we think about uh, roles that are more repetitive and routine, they can be easily automated, which is true. But even um, you take a role like a radiologist, and uh, there was a study done, or, or not study, but work done in California, where um, AI actually did a better job, more accurately read MRIs and, um, and in making the diagnosis. And so that doesn't mean that we won't need radiologists anymore, but what it means is the radiologists will now have the time to interact with humans, but they're not necessarily trained on that. How many of you have actually talked to your radiologist if you had any, uh, any scanning done? And so they're going to have to learn new skills. Uh, the second trend is demographics. A lot I can talk about there, but as I really try to... Uh, focus on what does it mean to work, um, there, there are a couple of trends I would point out. One is just the multi-generational workforce. We have Generation Z just um, entering the workforce, the millennials, of course, that we talk about a lot. Um, um, and then you have Gen Xers, you have boomers um, like myself, and, uh, and, and then you have the generation that came before me. Um, but the most fundamental demographic change is longevity. People are living longer and people are uh, projected to live even longer. And you often hear about this concept of uh, the hundred year life, which actually came from uh, Linda Grattan, a, a, a UK based uh, professor. And um, so what that means is because we're going to live longer, we're going to work longer. And this pattern of go to school, go to work, retire, and play golf um, is no longer the, the norm. That once and done model is done. We really are now in a place where people, the, the first 20 years or so will be focused mostly on learn, but then people will be working uh, and really uh, pursuing personal interests, coming in and out of the workforce, uh, for a much longer period of time. So a lot of implications for uh, organizations, but certainly for all of us at workers. How do we actually uh, learn continually in our lives um, to really make this possible? And the third one is changing social uh, societal expectations. Society is expecting more from business. They're expecting business to really have an impact 
um, beyond the bottom line to make a social contribution and this notion of uh, profits with purpose. Mm. So a lot of implication for organizations, but as I think about what does this mean for individuals and particularly within our community where volunteerism is, uh, is much more part of our DNA. And as organizations look for people that are aligned with their purpose and their, their, the greater good that they're pursuing, I think that individuals that have had volunteer experiences um, and have it in their DNA will really be able to show that values alignment in organizations. So those are, those are the three trends, um, technology, demographics, and changing societal expectations. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sabine. Those, that summary of technology, the demographic changes and changing societal expectations merged with profit and purpose are some really fantastic areas that we are seeing in society in the 21st century. In the past three months, we have come across and had COVID disrupt and impact our lives. So how has COVID impacted or accelerated or de decelerated mm -hmm. some of these trends that you just touched upon? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've been having a, a lot of conversations with, uh, with businesses, governments, as well as individuals around this. And you're so right in saying there's an acceleration and there's a deceleration and there's some entirely new things that have, that have popped up that we didn't even conceive of before. I think the first thing that comes to everyone's mind is this working from home. Um, and while organizations have been experimenting with that and had flexible work policies even in place, they haven't been used that much because to some extent there's a stigma attached to it. Uh, I, my, my neighbor works in financial services and he said to me, pre-COVID, when someone said, I'm working from home tomorrow, we'd say, yeah, sure, you're working from home. And today, of course, we know that that's possible. I'm sure the UK st stats are in the same range. The, in, in Canada, 42% um, of workers were working at home during the lockdown. And so that's about 5 million workers. And uh, that is, that number is staggering. We could have never, ever got to those kinds of numbers under any other circumstances. But I think what that shows is the capacity that we have as human beings as well. We adjusted, we learned, we tested. We're constantly um, getting better at working from home, using the tools, figuring out how to collaborate. But there is a burning platform that's visible. And so we have all come together and made it work. So as I think of some of the things in terms of being longer term successful in the future of work, that burning platform is not visible and it's not as immediate, but the future of work is now. And so how can we use and, and draw on some of those same human capacities that we have uh, to prepare ourselves to be successful? So as I also think about this, um, the, this um, uh, working from home, um, what the questions for me and for an individual then is how do you get really good at it? How do you become known as somebody who's got this figured out, who can be productive, um, who can support other uh, other colleagues and that's and and how do you describe that to an employer so for all of us that are doing that let's actually start to take some notes and uh, keep track of how we're adjusting and then articulate and, and do a story visualization is uh, is very powerful in terms of how you can convey to employers that I'm actually very adaptable and able to do this what we're seeing really in this environment is the rise of human skills, what people often call soft skills become really important. The other change that's accelerated is some of the culture change aspects where organizations, for example, breaking down of hierarchy. It's not so much, it's really more hierarchy of knowledge, not title or level as we are needing to solve problems quickly as we're working in unfamiliar circumstances. And so for somebody, for, for an employee, 
what I see there as an opportunity really is, are you stepping up? Are you taking this opportunity to really bring your best self forward and to bring visibility um, to, uh, for, about, for yourself to other people? and uh, other more other leaders in the organizations that you might not normally have that opportunity to. So use this moment to step up, to speak up, and to really demonstrate what you're able to do. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing, and uh, this actually was a client in the UK, this is an information company, a global company, and uh, one of the things he said, we, we just have to get things out the door and then iterate. So this is that notion of done is better than perfect. Mm. And so the entrepreneurial skills and um, really being comfortable taking risks. And you know, many of us come from entrepreneurial roots, certainly in terms of our parents and, uh, um, and uh, new immigrants often have strong entrepreneurial um, uh, mindsets and uh, it's one of the reasons they've actually taken the risk to go to a new country often and uh, so how do we draw on those and demonstrate that those entrepreneurial skills that maybe are uh, less visible in the in the previous setup and the final thing I would say in terms of uh, what's happening with COVID what I'm hearing from people is I love the humanity. I love being invited into people's homes. We, that never happens. You see little bits and pieces about people that you wouldn't have known. You see children, you see pets, and all of a sudden we're just more human and, and uh, being human is back in. in yeah. And so what does that mean to, to skills and how will we carry that forward into the workplace? Absolutely. I t totally agree, especially regarding the point on making or at least technology enabling people, organizations, institutions to be more human and mm -hmm. being on a Zoom call, being, being able to learn FaceTime and WhatsApp video calls so that grandparents can still interact and have that human connection with their families or their uh, brothers and sisters who are in a different part of the world just wouldn't have been as popular or as they wouldn't have picked up that those skill sets had what has happened not not had been in the situation that we're in so i think that there is a lot of adaptability and skill sets and uh, opportunities for people to learn some of the new ways of working and not just ways of working but just ways of life and the way that we yeah. interact with others and the way that we speak with others and connect in a way that we would never have connected in a way before. But you know, your point around this, what I would pick up, the thread I also pick up there is that's what lifelong learning is about. Yeah. It's not about going to school full time for three years only. That's a part of it. But uh, learning can be done in so many different forms. And when you're doing these things, you're, you're developing your curiosity, you're, you're actually feeding your curiosity. Uh, you have to adapt and work in different ways. And the knowledge that can be picked up is phenomenal. And uh, it, it also goes back to let's use this time. Uh, 10 years from now, when someone says, what did you do in 2020 during COVID? Um, I keep asking myself, I want that list to have some things on there where I've learned things that I wouldn't have otherwise. And uh, along with, you know, there's a few other categories, but learning is definitely on, uh, on that list. Absolutely. I'm hearing so many stories of people picking up skills that had been at the bottom of their to-do list or bottom of their bucket list, and they would never have got round to it had this time not been present. They would never have learned that coding language or programming language. They would never have picked up that book. They would never have learned that creative skill of painting or baking. So having the opportunities to do that and taking advantage of them now means that there are that overall people will become more well-rounded human beings. And I think mm -hmm. in the education sector, there has been a big push to introduce creativity into schooling and into the education curriculum. And there's this concept of STEAM. So we talk about STEM and science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But there is also the arts, the liberal arts, 
drama, public speaking, presentation, communication skills that all uh, can have a conceptualization of creating a well-rounded human being, someone who's going to have a positive impact on society. And we do a phenomenal job within our community of highlighting and promoting activities that allow people to be more well-rounded. And I think now numerous other institutions or people and wider society are getting involved in, in improving themselves, in becoming healthier, in learning new skills and taking part in lifelong learning. And Hazir Imam in 2008 said that learning or the ability to continually learn is going to define what is one of the most important skills of the 21st century and beyond. And so taking the message that we continually hear from my imam is so critical, especially during a time like this. I just maybe uh, riffing off that a little bit, this, this whole notion as you talk, as I think you've, you've really touched on of these human skills and, um, and they are things like, some of them are a little bit more, a little bit harder human skills like problem solving and critical thinking, more cognitive and, um, and, and creativity. And then you have things like empathy, really being able to um, um, put yourself in, in someone else's shoes. And so much work today, if you think about design thinking, for example, which is applied for customers, for employees, for citizens, uh, that's really what it's about. It's about having empathy and, and understanding what those who you are serving are actually looking for and building the experience around that. Um, collaboration, uh, teamwork, absolutely. We, and how do you do that in, a, in, in an environment where you don't physically connect? But to your point, we have been able to do it. For example, what we're doing here today would not have really happened uh, had we not become so comfortable with this technology and known that, you know, whether I'm sitting, we're sitting in the same room or 5,000 miles apart, uh, yeah. doesn't really matter. So this knowledge sharing, which is also something critical to organizations and something the Imam has talked about a lot, um, how we share knowledge, learn from each other, both you and I are going to leave this discussion having learned something, having uh, really broadened our, our mindset and being curious about things that we want to follow up on. And so those skills uh, are really this, the, what I say is the soft stuff is the hard stuff. And they are the power skills that are enduring. They're transferable. I had a long uh, career at RBC and I worked in many different parts of the organization. I started in the retail bank. I worked in the operations, technology, credit cards, uh, before I went into human resources and communications and corporate citizenship. But it was what really made that possible was those human skills. We didn't maybe articulate it in the same way, but I, worked in an organization that believed that you can actually teach people the technical part of the job and the knowledge. And what you become known for is somebody that can learn fast, somebody that's curious, somebody that can adapt. And, um, and so while it might take a little bit longer, what they also know is you're bringing knowledge from other parts of the organization or another organization, which makes you different. It's a different kind of value add that you bring to the table. So it's a it's a very real uh, concept and it's what's challenging is how do you describe that and how do you make it a little more tangible when you're discussing it with employers and i think that's the opportunity that that everyone has is to really tell a story about those skills where you've demonstrated them and how they're transferable absolutely being able to communicate and story tell how your your journey being able to mm -hmm articulate the experiences, the skills you've accumulated, what you've done up to that point becomes so critical and so important. And even when we think about industry and we think about numerous individuals who may focus solely on academics, it's not enough in the 21st century to just focus on one sector or one area. You actually become more, I guess, as a, more of an asset to society and more of a positive contributor 
with the more varied experiences that you do because you can take and bring into account multiple perspectives, look at things from different angles. And it's just so important that someone in industry be, is able to learn some of the more entrepreneurial skills and others who may not be involved within, let's say, technology as, or be involved in areas such as you know, uh, data analysis, that they also acquire those skills. If you're involved in the sciences, it's equally important to have the soft and the hard skills. But what mm -hmm. I really liked is where you said, you know, the power skills. Mm -hmm. And that becomes really, really critical. Areas around empathy, creativity, problem solving, critical thinking. This all becomes the building blocks of people exactly. able to build better versions of maybe what they would have done previously. So take this, we take this as very much an opportunity to build some of those building blocks and to continue the work that, that, that you can do in somewhat of a varied way, but being well-rounded well in the work that you do. And that's really the, the fundamental of st the concepts of STEAM and creativity mm -hmm. and being able to articulate these areas. But I really love the point you mentioned about just being a, being a storyteller, going back mm -hmm. to reading some of those fiction, fiction books and applying the way that some of, them, some of those are articulated to your own life so that you can tell a story about, about what you do and who you are. Exactly. And I'm often asked by parents, what can I do for uh, parents of young children who are still mm. in, in uh, kindergarten or primary school, nursery school or primary school? Yeah. And um, these, these power skills are something that parents can really have a huge influence on. Um, so we take curiosity, for example, what's your dinner table conversation? Are you um, are you asking good questions? Are you, are you teaching your children to ask good questions? In fact, I would say with curiosity, your kids can actually teach you because we beat it out of them. Uh, so perhaps not, not the best example, but empathy. Um, some, of these, um, some of these power skills are, are really something that I think we, as parents, we, we just subconsciously do it. But how can you crystallize that a little bit more and, and, and think about um, how those skills are actually developed in, in, um, in, in children and, and certainly something like resilience, which is really being called upon in, in this particular time. And um, I think sometimes we, we do hear that perhaps the, this, the generation of really young children have not um, had to deal with as many um, challenges and the resilience may not have been built up as, as much. So this is a great time during COVID to really, uh, again, help to crystallize that learning for, for, for children um, around what that means and how you bounce back and, um, and, and forge ahead and face the challenges. So again, a lot of opportunities to incorporate, I, I talk about it as learning in the flow of life, in the flow of work. There is absolutely the formal part of learning, but so much of it happens uh, day in and, and, and day out. And uh, along with some of that formal commitment and time is always the big obstacle that people, uh, you know, we all put up. But at the end of the day, we do make choices about how we spend our time. And uh, I love the analogy of fitness. You, you don't just go to the gym and, and do things to stay fit until you, you graduate from university. You don't stop. You actually continue it. And trust me, as you get more mature in life, you actually need it even more. <laughs> and I have my gym set up behind me here as, uh, as the gyms are closed. And, um, and so it's the same with learning. You, there are choices that we make and how do you carve out that time to what you watch on Netflix? There are a lot of good documentaries and yeah. uh, lots of online learning. So, or, and, uh, and that's ultimately, I think when How's Your Mom talks about um, lifelong learning, it's that combination of formal um, and informal, and of course, the coaching and mentoring, which is something that as um, community members, there's an opportunity there, I think, to learn with and from different generations as well. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And from a lot of what you've been saying regarding lifelong education and some of the things that people can do, whether it be at online courses or taking part and watching one of the shows on, you know, Smiley TV to learn baking or learn how to Zumba, maybe for the first time. Um, a lot of these are different skills that people are acquiring and these become some of these building blocks that allow people to thrive and increase their self-esteem, their confidence, and just the variety of things that, and opportunities that this opens up for people. In a lot of the articles and blogs and written essays that I've read that, that, that you've authored, you speak a lot about a skills-led recovery uh, being the new currency of the future of work. I was just hoping you could touch upon that, that idea because I found that really, really interesting uh, as I was reading through. Yeah, I think we're really moving from this notion of jobs to skills because of the rapid change in, in, in jobs. For example, um, most primary school children, when they graduate from university, they will go into jobs that don't even exist today. And, uh, and even if you think about some of the jobs, we talked a little, you know, I had an example of a physician where clearly we're going to need physicians, but how they do their work is going to change dramatically. And again, we saw that in COVID, how the telehealth or video um, uh, health has just skyrocketed. And that requires, again, that requires uh, different skills. So, um, you know, the, 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 the notion of skills is they become, it's like, a, I think of it like a portfolio. Your portfolio has skills and experiences. And it's the skills that are more transferable. Um, the, particularly the, um, the, the human skills that, that we talked about. And at the same time, the digital skills have to be continually kept up to date. The half-life of, of technical skills now is about three to five years. So for all of us, it's not just about getting the next promotion. It's actually about being able to continue to be productive and be able to do the the jobs or the roles that we're that we're in today. And so I think when you break it down as well into into this notion of skills, it becomes you, you we hear about micro credentials, for example, where um, where you're really adding to um, to that portfolio, you want diversification, just like a financial portfolio. I knew that my banking would come into play at some <laughs> point. And you, it, in a portfolio, you shed the non-performing stocks and you add new stocks that you think have a longer term payback. And skills are very much the same. You're, you may not be able to use them right away, but the diversification gives you optionality as the world changes, as jobs change. Uh, the fact that you're constantly pruning and adding is the kind of skill that that you need for uh, for 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 your careers. And you know, most of us we do, we review our financial portfolios at regular periods of time, and we have a couple of action items, and um, we you know may work with an advisor, which is a good idea as well from a career point of view. And I often say to people that our work. The, is, is actually more in many ways um, being able to optimize what we do and what we earn and how that's managed um, is really the most important financial decision you're making as well. Um, and, and, you know, I want to be clear here. It's not about just seeking jobs that pay well, because I'm a strong believer that you go with your passion, you go with where you want to uh, really contribute and where there's opportunity, but then you get really good at it, whatever it is that you, that, that you choose. Uh, but, you know, re so it's not so much about absolute amount, but the choices that you make and, and how you bring your skills to bear has the biggest impact on the quality of life as well as your, uh, as well as your future. And I think typically we don't really spend very much time on that and, and, take that time to, to step back and to reflect, which many of us have a little bit more time right now. So why not step back and say, 
what is it that I want to be doing in my work life for the next five to 10 years? And how do I chart that path? Absolutely. And I think we're seeing a big rise, even in the UK, we are seeing 83% of people wanting the option to be able to work from home from a study done by a really large consultancy mm -hmm. in the UK. As well as that, we are also seeing children and kids looking at having an online or wanting to pursue a variety of different careers because they see that other people are doing the same thing. No one is staying in a job for one particular time. And we are seeing this kind of growth in the amount of people wanting to kind of take control of their own destiny in wanting mm -hmm. to set up their own businesses. We are now seeing teenagers, there, there's been a huge rise, I think 72% from a recent study conducted of teenagers wanting to run their own businesses, their own enterprises and be in charge of their own destiny. And I think that that is one remarkable statistic because we're not just seeing that from mm -hmm least in the UK, and I'm sure it's replicable elsewhere, for that age group, we are seeing that across the board. We are seeing uh, folks who have been uh, professionals, uh, economic professionals, economic productive pr professionals for a number of years, for decades, now looking at COVID has disrupted their life. But how can we turn that disruption into an opportunity to do something that they would never have done or had the opportunity to do had it not come into their life when it did and whether that be setting up their own businesses whether it be joining a new club if it is uh, learning a new instrument they would never have taken up these opportunities so i think it really goes back to the point you were saying which is pursuing your passion and using this time as that opportunity to say how do i want to design my life how do I want my life to, to go? In what direction do I want it to go? And now is the time whereby people can, can take that step back and be able to really think about how they want to design that in a way that, that suits their way of working. And we have even seen in the technology fields and the environment, a number of companies are now permanently shifting towards a distributed model. So we talk about people changing their own destiny, but companies are changing their destiny. They are now allowing their workforce to be entirely distributed. And this isn't just uh, you know, very, very small companies. This is companies as large as Facebook and Twitter who are giving their employees the option not to ever go back to the office. And they're happy for them to stay in their homes if they feel that that is the way they want to design their life and be the most productive. And it also touches upon the other point you uh, mentioned beforehand regarding resiliency adaptability and empathy, which is being able to un understand people in this way of working and at the same time being resilient and flexible enough to adjust, to adapt. We spoke about iteration and the company iterating their strategy. Mm -hmm. Maybe people are also iterating and, and changing and tweaking how they want to design their life and what they want to do. So we are seeing that across the board, whether it be te technology companies to uh, individuals to uh, larger institutions and groups and I can only see that trend continuing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely and it's and the and, and your needs change over time as well so that's where the the flexibility adaptability of yourself as well as uh, as well as organizations comes into play but what may be at a certain point in time this an arrangement of working from home for example may be perfect for, for someone later on. They, they, the need or the desire for more uh, social contact, um, for being in a different environment, or sometimes there isn't a suitable environment to work in at, um, at home, means that they will want to do something different. So absolutely flexibility at both ends. And the comment you made about entrepreneurialism, absolutely. And that is a skill that, uh, organizations value as well, large organizations. And so again, how, you know, I'm seeing that in, in how hiring patterns are, are changing where that's really valued because a lot of the skills we talked about earlier, um, curiosity, ability to learn, um, creativity, um, resiliency, um, and, uh, and often, and I, somebody who can take ideas to action is, uh, is what you see there. And so 
what we'll see more of in the future of work is people moving uh, from different uh, in and out of different forms of employment so from employee to contractor to freelancer to entrepreneur to sabbatical and that's one of the things while there are many similarities gen uh, generationally i think with the millennials and 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 following them probably gen z will be similar they're much more comfortable moving in and out of different forms of work and uh and and now we've discovered that that actually can work for um beyond them because we've we've done the hard work of habits are formed i think they say in um 60 days i think is the the number so we we're way past that um and so you know it's a, it's a capacity that we have for sure Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me about the sabbatical that I am hoping to take very, very soon. Excellent. Uh, so one thing I wanted to leave everyone with was mm -hmm. practical takeaways. And there are lots of people tuning in, whether it be new entrants into the job market to people who've been in employment for an incredibly long time and they are mid-career to people who don't necessarily need to work but they want to work and they're maybe approaching some of the, the latter years of their career so thinking about those at least at least those three areas and potentially others when we if we were to start with new entrants what would you say or what advice would you give them thinking about the discussion that we had and what should they be focusing on and thinking about regarding this concept of the future of work yeah. So let me let me actually start there, uh, maybe with uh, with with perhaps empathy. Uh, I think for a lot of new graduates, there is a bit of a concern and disappointment. They have worked hard. They uh, graduated with lots of hopes and dreams for what their first job would be. And right now it feels like a setback if that that hasn't materialized. The thing to remember is this is if you go back to the hundred year life, in the whole scheme of things, you have many decades of work ahead of you. And so how can you use this moment to really step back and reflect on what it is you want in the next decade of your work life and adjust if you need to take the opportunities to upskill to to build that portfolio that actually allows you to do um, something a little bit different that you perhaps weren't quite as prepared to or really get you know get ready to um to when when the time comes to enter uh into the workforce and um so don't worry about it i would say uh, in fact i was watching a video on uh, one of our smiley um networks and um ali velshi who i'm sure many people know he's um he's on uh uh, MSNBC and uh, he said uh, you know it's a little bit like the Second World War in that everything was halted uh, but we did get through it and and what's different now is people are going to live longer and so there is um, ample time for you to catch up economically and from a career point of view for the entrance uh, but what I would say is it, start building out their portfolio, work um, experiences, and volunteer experiences. Those are increasingly being valued, particularly when you can make it tangible with, this is what I did, this is what I learned. Um, I, I, and don't, when you see a job um, opportunity, think about what am I gonna learn? Not what are my friends gonna think? What's it gonna look like on LinkedIn? You know, I'm not in the same job as my buddies from, from my class. Judge your success by your own standards. And I made many choices during my career that at the time people would, would, wond would have wondered, I took a job at a lower level, which many people would call a demotion. I knew that I was gonna learn from that experience and I absolutely did and I made up for it. Um, over time and um, I just ignored what I knew would be the water cooler chatter around what happened is she off the career track what's going on I I knew why I had made that choice and so I know it's hard with social media uh, but 
don't um, really try to, 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 to make choices on learning and, and judging success by your own standards. Absolutely. I love that. Judging success by your own standards should really just be a mantra of life to many, many mm -hmm. people. So I absolutely mm -hmm. love that comment. And so shifting gears a little bit, if you were now putting ourselves in, in, in the shoes of someone who is mid-career, whereby they have probably got and accumulated a few years of experience and they've been in an industry or an area for a long time, what advice would you give them? So I started off by talking about human machine collaboration, regardless of what your, your career, your profession is, we are all going to have to figure out how to use technology in, in our work and how to work side by side with technology. It isn't, it's no longer about, oh, you know, I'm going to retire in a few years and, and I can get by. Um, I would say really building up, and it's not about all of us becoming coders, but it's really being digitally savvy, de data savvy, and, and really starting to um, understand and even lead in using technologies like AI, for example, to, um, to, to have some of the uh, routine repetitive work um, being, being, done by uh, by the technology and building those those human capacities and the ability to move into a, um, a that sort of work and in many professions will be are already being affected accounting law um, we talked about medicine so um, absolutely um, do that um, the other thing i mean i've talked about upskilling full-time part-time go back and and build out those skills and for the digital capabilities, think about reverse mentoring with, with, um, with a younger person where they can help you accelerate on the digital um, skills and where you can share some of your knowledge, some of the, the soft skill development or the power skill development. And I have found I have used reverse mentoring a lot. In fact, um, even now with COVID, I'm pretty much able to keep it up through through this channel. And certainly when I was um, the HR head at, uh, at RBC, every week I met with three young people um, and who worked in the company. And, um, and it was, in, in fact, for every two in the company, one outside, to stay current on what's going on, to know what's important to them from a work point of view, and to learn from them. To learn not just technology, but many other ways of thinking. And that was a choice I made uh, in terms of, of learning. And they often thought they were being mentored by me, but I actually was getting more that, than I gave. So that's, uh, I think that's a great way uh, for, for anyone to, um, to, to really do that kind of reciprocal learning. Absolutely. I love the idea of reverse mentoring. I think it's a really, really good concept that more people should think about applying as a way for them to learn and upskill. And we talk about there's one way to upskill, which is you can go back to school full time, but that might not be an option for some people with, with children or due to family circumstances or other external circumstances. But doing the small things and at, some at times having conversations with people who you typically wouldn't have conversations with, mm -hmm different age groups, different demographics, exactly. uh, different parts of society, you will learn so much more from that than you would at times from picking up uh, your Sunday newspaper. So having these different perspectives and these conversations can open up so much more possibility and opportunity. So even the small things really count in that respect. Yeah. And for him, one thing we didn't touch on that I think is worth touching on for, for any of the, the, the groups is the, um, is the skilled trades, mm. uh, where whether it's electricians, welders, plumbers, construction, those jobs are changing very, very fast. There's that human machine collaboration is, is certainly playing into it. And um, they are, um, they offer a, a lot of flexibility. They're, you know, they're well-paid jobs. And um, not everyone is, we're all different and we, we take different paths. And, and, and I think those are absolutely um, skills to consider 
and it's going to be a while for some of those jobs before technology can uh, can take that over. I, I don't know if uh, if a robot can come and fix my bathroom yet, but uh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. There might be a young Ismaili building that right now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great, fantastic. And for those who want or are maybe approaching near the end of their, let's say, professional career, but they still have the energy, the passion, the want to carry on working and contribute to society, what advice would you give them, even leaning on your own experiences mm -hmm. from spending uh, you know, a partial amount of your time at Deloitte. I think people would love to hear about some of those areas and experiences too. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's I, this concept of portfolio is one that I really like. So I have a, a, a what's often called a portfolio career. I actually call it a portfolio life. And um, so I spend 25% of my time in sort of the commercial business end as an advisor to Deloitte. And I, and I sit on the, um, as a non-executive director on the board of a retailer. And, um, and the rest of the time, I, um, I, I work, I, I do pro bono volunteer work in um, government, not-for-profits, and, and uh, academia. And for me, the, uh, I love to learn. So I, I, have, I know I have to be doing that. I, it allows me to contribute and it allows me to bring in terms of my experience, I would say it's the knowledge, but it's the relationships that I bring to, to bear where I'm actually able to make connections across sectors. And uh, if I'm working with uh, in the academic side, I work with a social innovation hub of a university and um, they were doing this fantastic project with, um, um, with uh, actually uh, micro entrepreneurialism with refugees. And so I was able to connect him to somebody in the not for profit sector, somebody in the, in the government sector that are interested in these areas. And something may or may not come out of it, but it's really the making those connections is, is, is a big part of uh, what I feel I bring to the party. So um, what I would say here, and some people need to work and for the financial reasons, and some people uh, do it because we want to be contributing and, and, and have a lot to offer. And um, so regardless of, of how it's done, think about how you can prepare for it. And, and to me, I, while I did do it consciously, the, the relationships and being very involved externally beyond my RBC world was were probably critical um so that's that's a little bit of the the prep part uh, but for people in that age group i think think about working from home that might open up a whole new possibility with sometimes mobility might be a little um um you know might be a a, a bit of a barrier and and so get yeah really get really good on some of those digital skills and ability to use all the tools and there might be a whole set of new opportunities that comes through the the uh the working from home and there are probably a lot of skills that people have and they may just need a platform to show those skills and mm -hmm. social media to a lot of the video technologies that are out there right now to other remote working style tools mm -hmm. just allow you the opportunity to have a platform to teach others, to connect to others. And there could be opportunities knocking at your door right now. And if you were to just learn some of those skills in six, you know, fast forward six, 12, 24 months, you'll see some of those results or you'll, you'll never believe how much progress you've made within that time from just having that, that kind of uh, courage and confidence to take up some of those skills or learn something new that you hadn't done before to engage with people in a completely different way. And especially as we move to a more distributed workforce mm -hmm. where people have autonomy and ownership of exactly. their life and how they want to design their life, all of these skills and these areas and these tools will just feature a lot more prominently as we kind of go towards this human machine collaboration. So make mm -hmm. the machine 
work work for you rather than the other way around. Yeah, and I would say that this notion of judge your success by your own standard mm. kicks in as well. There are choices, you, you may not, you're likely not going to be in the same kind of role with the same, uh, whether, it's, whether it's pay, whether it's prestige, whether it's visibility, and, and that's just fine. So very much for myself, I came from, for the as as you mentioned, you know the largest bank in in Canada, um, and uh, and and um, and actually the largest um, in uh, on on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Although there is a tech company now, Shopify, which uh, which is neck and neck. So I don't know where they are today, but um, I, that's not what I have now, and that's not what I want now. I'm happy to be leading and supporting and advising from the background and contributing in a different way and helping to build the next generation of leaders um, is, is a huge opportunity, I think, for, uh, for people at sort of my stage uh, and age in life. And the rewards, I say to people, I get more than I give. That's, I think, a great place to, uh, to, to end the, this, this stage in career and in fact, any stage, don't wait to be involved, that's one piece of advice. People always ask me, what, you know, what's your advice? Don't wait to get involved in community, civil society until you retire and have more time. It makes you a better human being, a better parent, a better spouse, and um, uh, a better leader, a better manager, and uh, the, the rewards far um, outweigh uh, the time that you put into it. Absolutely. And it's been incredible even having these conversations with you to learn more about your journey and how you have helped to develop the next generation of leaders. And I have to say, it's incredibly inspiring to, to be a part of this and to see your work in action as well, to see that impact. And it's one of those where I feel if you were to plant a very small seed, that seed decides to multiply in a variety of different directions to spread to this positivity and this, this radiance across it so being able to give back is probably the most rewarding form of what anyone can do and any, anyone can do it from in, in a large way or in a really really tiny tiny way and i think that, that's so important for people to be to be considering as well and as, as we kind of wrap up our discussion as well you know we've spoken about so many different topics mm -hmm. what are some of the key takeaways that you want people to to, to leave this discussion with mm -hmm. So um, let's, let's see, let's go back. So skills um, are the currency in the, in the future of work. Continually build those skills, build that portfolio, learn, learn, learn. Be curious, ask lots of questions, and learning through experience is really the best way to learn. Get the formal skills, but then use them. Build those human skills. We talked a lot about uh, about them and try to make them more more tangible and and uh, for for young entrants it's really the proof of potential somebody coined it that way which I really like so how do you actually bring that forward uh, of course being digitally savvy is um, is important and do pursue what you're passionate about look at what the opportunities are around um, what your passion is because you you need to make that choice consciously um, and then be excellent at whatever you do that's that's another thing that that has your mom has talked about a lot the concept of mer meritocracy and of excellence and um, because with whatever you choose to do that excellence and that level of commitment will will ensure that you do well in in your chosen in your chosen field and um there there is no elevator um to uh to the top of your career you have to take the stairs <laughs> i really love that and really really well beautifully put so in in summary skills are the currency in the future of work so build your portfolio life as you call it, um, continue with formal and informal learning, 
cultivate skills around curiosity, asking questions, continually learning and adapting your your or at least your creativity and your creativity gene, as they call it, and yes. flexing your creativity muscles uh, to be able to be more resilient, to be more empathetic, to be more human as we look at how the future of work is going to develop. There's no doubt that we will be uh, or need to have a digital savvy mindset as we go forward. But it's also important that we cultivate these very human grounded, these power skills as you, as you spoke about so beautifully before and combine these so that we can fulfill kind of our vision of how we want our life to be, but also of Hazar Imam's vision of continually uh, learning and continually growing and contributing back to society as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Zabine, for joining us today. Uh, this is another Thinking of Work series, and uh, it's been my pleasure to host this discussion with you. Uh, so thank you so much once again, and uh, and Yalinda. Um, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I, uh, I I hope that we stay in touch. A new connection, and uh, Yalinda to everyone. <laughs>